uh, for the dig-in leaders. That's at 6.30 in Gemtown. And make sure uh, you RSVP uh, for child care needs uh, with Jennifer to let her know. All right? Also, uh, this Wednesday night, Refuel, our midweek adult Bible study, resumes uh, right here in the sanctuary at 6.30 p.m. Okay? At this time, I'm going to ask Amanda. Where's Amanda? There's Amanda. It's going to come and uh, uh, let you know something exciting that's uh, beginning uh, uh, with Refresh for our women's ministry. Go ahead. Good morning. Happy New Year. Ladies, I am so excited this year. We are going to begin our Bible study on January the 14th. I am going to do it for two days during the week. I'll do it on Sunday evenings, and then I'll also do it on Tuesday nights. If you're a big talker, you might want to come on Tuesdays because we'll have a little bit more time. But uh, it's called Truth Field, and I am so excited about studying the word together with the women in our church please consider the reason i wanted to make this announcement today is if you would like to have a book and not pay shipping on it i can order them today if not you can get the book at lifeway or you can get the book at mardell's or several places online but it's by ruth toy simmons we've done one of hers before and it's just a great bible study any age women are welcome to come and join us from young to old and uh, study the Word of God, starting off this year talking about being truth-filled in the Word. Amen. Thank you, Miss Amanda. I encourage you to come uh, be a part of that. I have one last announcement. I want to go ahead and do this now so uh, after worship he's able to come. We have Mike Manning. Uh, coming today with the Harmony Baptist Association missionary. He's going to be coming today uh, to share God's word with us. And we, we thank you for being here, our brother Mike. Always is a blessing to hear him uh, share God's word with us, especially today as, as brother Paul is out. So uh, when we're done with worship, he'll come right on up and uh, you'll be blessed, I know, by what God uh, shares with us through him. Okay? All right, we're here for worship today. I was thinking about this earlier. Uh, you'll kind of see the ongoing theme. It's kind of like having Thanksgiving uh, in on December 31st, okay, uh, if you will, because we're going to sing some songs that just praise God for what he's done in our lives and in our church uh, throughout this uh, entire year. Everybody good with that? Amen. Amen. Let's start uh, by singing this opening hymn, To God Be the Glory. Let's sing.
Amen. As we continue in worship today, our next song is called I Believe. Uh, it's important for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, even to confess back to Him uh, what He has blessed us with. The opening line of the song that says, I believe in the blood of Jesus, it washes white as snow. I believe in the power of the gospel that makes the broken whole. So much to praise the Lord for today as we worship. the gospel still makes the broken whole. I believe that the Christ of sin was broken when they rolled away that stone. I believe, I believe, I believe. You see, as I
We want to share from God's Word today. Uh, it's a powerful passage of Scripture. It comes from Psalm 27, verse 4. It says, One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble, He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Verse 13, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. As we look back on this last year, uh, I think it's probably safe to say and we'd all agree that this year has not been trouble free, right? Amen. Amen. Not been trouble free. But here's the good news is you made it to today. Another day to worship God here in this room. So if you have nothing else to be thankful for, it's for the blessing of life in this room today and that God gave you the air to breathe to be able to worship Him on December 31st, 2023. There's two takeaways from this passage for worship. Number one, we want to dwell in the house of the Lord. Because the presence of God is a powerful place. Number two is to look for the goodness of God in the land we're living in. Look for the goodness of God and praise Him for whatever that is. We kind of reflect upon that from what God has done this past year. And it's also a reminder as we step into a new year for what God reminds us here in Psalm 27 with the Psalm of David, that the way we're to approach worship and living our lives. So here's what we're going to do. We can't not have a church right now without giving you an opportunity just to pray personally, privately to the Lord. And if nothing else, to praise Him for allowing you to make it to this moment. Praise Him for bringing you through those trials this year. And to thank Him as you look back and see the goodness of God in the land that you are living in. Could have been a hospital room. Could have been a tough moment anywhere else in this world. But to praise Him for the goodness and that He never left you nor forsake you during this year. So we're just going to uh, pray silently. Uh, this is worship. This is what worship is. Not necessarily singing a song. It's praising God for His goodness. So uh, the altar is open as always throughout the entire service. But for sure right now, uh, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. So we're just going to kind of reflect upon um, the goodness of God. You pray silently and then I'll, I'll close this. Heavenly Father, God, we pause in this moment and now to give you all glory, honor, and praise. God, we come before you, God, with thanksgiving in our hearts. God, as we see your hand and the goodness of who you are, God, in the land that we're living in. No matter where we go, God, we can see your goodness. If we'll just focus our hearts and our lives upon that. God, that you work together for the good of those who love you, God. And we do today. I pray that our hearts will show you that today. 
God, as we praise your precious and your holy name, for you are worthy of all of our praise, God, for what you've done in our lives throughout this entire year. God, and even this morning, God, as we reflect upon those things, God, we realize just how blessed we are. We are blessed because we have the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, that you provided a way for that, God. So, God, even this side of heaven this morning, God, may our gaze be transfixed upon Jesus' face. God, as we worship before you are worthy, God, we pray all this. God, as you hear your children pray to you, God, we pray all of this in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Worship today with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his
kind of forced that upon the youth. And it's so hard to watch that crucifixion scene, right? When he's up on the cross and it's just hard to keep your eyes looking at that scene. But you know, as good as that movie is, I think they really missed the mark. Because in the Old Testament, when they're pros- prophesying about what the crucif- crucifixion is going to be like, they talk about how, you know, Jesus' beard was ripped from his face. They talk about how he was beaten so he was unrecognizable as human. Can you imagine if they had portrayed that in the movie? And I heard a story the other day that just kind of brought it all home to me. There was this mom and young girl, and this mom was horribly disfigured. Her face was unrecognizable. She was just, um, she had been through a lot. And she would take her daughter to school every day, and the kids, you know, kids can be so cruel. But kids would laugh and point fingers and make fun of this mom and this daughter, and the daughter would come home from school every day crying. And then one day, when the daughter got old enough, the mom explained to her that there was this fire, and she had gone in to bring the baby out, and she had been burned over all her body. And from that moment on, the daughter realized that when she looked at her mom, she no longer saw shame. She saw love. She saw what love looked like and how much she was loved. And I think when we rise to meet Jesus and we see him for the first time, I think what we're going to see is love. We're going to see love like we've never known it before. What we're going to see is how much he loves us and what he has done for us. I think we will be more than transfixed. I think we're going to be so captivated and so... I have no words. I think we won't be able to look away. All we're going to be able to do is praise the name. be seated. What a great time for worship. Let's, uh, let's pause for a minute, if we might, and uh, 
pray and thank the Lord for this time that we've shared already. Lord God, we are grateful and thankful to be together. But most of all, we're thankful for the privilege of coming and, and worshiping. Oh, Lord God, may our time never be perfunctory. May it never be routine. May we never, ever, ever come and sing empty words and try to impress each other with our spirituality or with our love for you that may or may not be what it appears to be. Oh, Lord God, we are all on a journey, and uh, we're never going to reach the end until we reach the end. And now we see through a glass dimly, and there's a day coming we'll see you face to face, and we'll know so much more than we know now. We'll love so much more than we know now, than we love now, and we'll understand you and appreciate your love in ways we can't even imagine now. So God be glorified in this time that we spend together in this church with these people. Open our ears and hearts, eyes to your word. Help us, Lord, to leave here affected. Changed, beginning change, continuing change. All for the glory of God and for the edification of your people. Thank you, Lord, for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm glad to be with you today. Thank you for letting me come. I don't know if I've said this before, but it always appears to me that anytime I come and preach, the pastors disappear. I don't know what the deal is with them. <laughs> Brother Paul particularly. I have to watch him. He's a great guy. I'm very thankful for him, for his partnership in ministry and for his friendship personally, and uh, I'm grateful to be here thankful for this church. We, uh, as we move to 2024, can you believe that? 2024. Uh, I, I don't have to tell you that we live in precarious times and days. If you don't realize that, then you probably are not paying attention or have your head in the sand or something. We live in difficult times. Uh, and we don't know how bad they really are. I've heard somebody say one time that things are not as bad as you think they are. But neither are they as good as you think they are either. So we don't know for sure everything going on. And we're probably glad we don't know everything going on. We don't know everything going on in the world scene. We don't know everything that God is up to. But we do know that he has, as we've said this morning, given us life and sustenance. And here we are on the verge of entering 2024. So what's ahead? How do we navigate these days that are coming ahead? Is our future up to God or is it up to us? Well, it depends on how you look at it. I've been pondering that issue quite a lot lately, and I even wrote a, a brief article about it um, just uh, not long ago, and I thought I might expand on that uh, topic a bit this morning. And so basically what I want to talk to you about is the tension between doing and resting. I mean, we, we can't just sit back and let God do everything, and yet God has to do a lot. But as we're going to see in the passage we'll look at this morning, if it's all up to us, then it's going to really come to naught. We don't have a great deal to offer God and ourselves. So... Uh, it's easy to see the extremes. It's easy to think either or. Well, it's either God or it's me. And I know you, you know better than that, but that's the tendency that we tend to do. We tend to say, oh, Lord, deliver us. And, or we tend to take things in our own hands and do it our own way. I'm reminded of, of Moses at the Red Sea. You remember the story when the people of Israel had been, God had delivered them from Egypt. Pharaoh finally, after a lot of headaches for him, 
agreed to let the people go, and as soon as they left, he began to pursue them and chase them up to the edge of the Red Sea, and Moses, in his great uh, words of faith, said, stand still and watch the, the power of God. He said, watch, see what God is going to do here. And uh, he says, well, let me just quote it. He says uh, in verse chapter, Exodus 14, verse 13, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. I mean, that sounds great, doesn't it? Is that not a statement of faith? I mean, these guys... Pharaoh and all his chariots and and soldiers are right at at them. They're camping out there ready to get them. And he's saying, stand and watch God. What a statement of faith. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Another, that just sounds, I wish I had that kind of faith. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to go forward. Wait a minute. I I thought we were trusting in you. God is saying, in essence, yes, you are. So go forward. And you know what happened when they went forward? God parted the sea. But their responsibility was to trust God, not just to say, watch God, but to move as they watched God and to trust Him and to act. And so God parted the sea, got the people miraculously through. The Egyptian soldiers followed behind. God closed the sea on them. So did they see the salvation of God? Yes. But not standing idle. Uh, James, well, before I get to James, biblically speaking, the right perspective lies somewhere in the middle between watching and trusting God and doing. So is God in control? Yes. Is he working on our behalf? Yes. Do we have responsibility in the mix of all of that? Yes. It's not either or. It's both and. James, as I was going to say, states in chapter 4 of his book that We should not say exactly what we will do tomorrow because we don't know what tomorrow will bring, but rather say, if the Lord wills, we'll live and also do this or that. Otherwise, we'll be boasting of we know what's going to happen tomorrow. Has has anything ever happened to you that you didn't expect? Of course it has. If it hasn't, it will because you're not in control as much as some of us want to be. And as much as some of us think we are, ultimately, we're not in control. God is in control of everything. Every good and perfect gift, James says, comes from the Lord. Even when you think you've earned it and when you think you've done it, God is behind the scenes. Sometimes behind the scenes, sometimes on the very front of the scene. And doing what he does for his glory, number one, and also for our sake. You remember what Paul said in Romans 8, we know that all things work together for good for them that love God and who are called according to his purpose. God is in process of shaping us and taking us into the direction for which he's called us and appointed us. So we have God's part and we have our part. Uh, Proverbs 16, 9 says, "The the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So you can plan all you want, but that doesn't mean you're going to get to do everything you plan. Am I right? Yeah, you know that, don't you? You've experienced that. When was the last time you had great plans and they just, no matter how hard you tried, it didn't happen? Well, you can write it up to coincidence or maybe I didn't work hard enough or whatever, and maybe some of that's... Maybe you didn't work hard enough. But it may be that God providentially intervened and took you in a a different direction that you did not anticipate and then you did not seek after or that you did not um, plan. 
All right, so uh, I want us to go to Psalm 127. That's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. Psalm 127. It is called one of the songs of a or psalm or song of ascent, ascending. They're going up to Jerusalem for worship, either at a feast or uh, some kind of offering or something going on. And there were 15 psalms uh, between Psalm 120 and 34, inclusive. And four are attributed to David. One, this one, is attributed to Solomon. And the rest are, we don't know who wrote them. They're anonymous. But they're songs in preparation for worship or thanksgiving or whatever it is they were getting ready to do. Reflection and acknowledgement of God's working. In Psalm 127 that we see this morning, the word vanity uh, appears three times in these five verses, which sounds much like Solomon, doesn't it, from Ecclesiastes, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. And so you see Solomon's uh, hand in this and his emphasis in this. So the setting of this psalm then is a focus on practical aspects of life for God's people. The psalm does not minimize the importance of people's role in living and our responsibilities. It doesn't minimize that, but it, it does emphasize the primacy of God or Yahweh as they would, as it is written in the Hebrew text, somewhat like that. The covenant God, the God who has called these people together and is working behind the scenes and sometimes, again, not just behind the scenes, but He's not working just covertly, but overtly, and, and he's doing and bringing about what he has promised that he would do. And he never wants them to forget who's in charge. And so that's how this is all written, with that understanding and those reminders prominent in this text. It's not just any God. It's the God of the covenant, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one who put all of this together, the one who created all that is, the self-existent one. The term that we call Yahweh is sometimes called, talked about, talks about him being the self-existent one and sometimes him being the, he's always called that in recognition of being the covenant God of Israel, that he made promises that he will keep no matter what they do, he'll keep his promises. Whether people realize it or not, the involvement of God is crucial to every facet of life. And I believe whether you are a believer and follower of Christ or if you're not, God is still in control of all that goes on. And so you think, well, what about the heathen and ungodly people seem to be so successful? Well, what about it? It doesn't change whether God's at work or not. He just may not be doing what you think he ought to do. And he may be doing what they don't recognize that he's doing. And all of the so-called uh, successes and wealth maybe and enjoyment and things of life that they seemingly enjoy, I mean, most of that's going to come to nothing anyway. It just won't matter. So don't let society fill, sell you a bill of goods that if I could just be like them, then things would be better. Uh, young people, I know that it's easy to, to get caught up in what, what you're uh, the people you like in music and theater and movies and television, all that are doing. I mean, uh, it, it looks glitzy, and on the surface it may look appealing. But you delve into most of these people's lives, and you'll find that many of them are just an absolute wreck. And I'm not saying it because I disagree with their lifestyle. It's just the fact. So be careful of what you, uh, who you follow and who you elevate as good models to follow. So let's look at the psalm, Psalm 127. And so we're going to, and let me just read it, and then we'll come back and, and look at it briefly and won't spend a whole lot of time. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, 
For he gives to his beloved, uh, my text, the New American Standard says, uh, even in his sleep, the words even in his are added to the text. He probably best rendered, he gives his beloved sleep, rest. I think contextually that's better. You don't have to eat, you don't have to worry about all killing yourself for things because he's in control and, and one of the ways that he keeps you from doing that is to give you sleep, let you rest. Verse 3, behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Some of you may question that a bit. <laughs> like arrows in the hands of a hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with the enemies at the gate. So let's go back and look at the passage with this, with this perspective of considering the tension between doing and resting. What's my part? What's God's part? Well, this doesn't answer all of it, but it does give a pretty good overview. Verse 1 again. We have this tension in, the, in building and guarding, building, protecting all the things that we think we do to, to help provide, particularly men for our families. Unless the Lord, this covenant God, unless He's the one who builds the house, he doesn't say don't build houses. He's just saying unless God is involved in it, unless God is the one behind the scenes doing his thing, whatever you do is in vain. They labor in vain who build it. To, to build means in this text, it has the idea of making something come together, making it happen. The, the idea of labor, the one who, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. That concept has to do with severely difficult labor, tiresome. You're about to work yourself to death, is what he says. No matter how much you do that, you, your labor like that is in vain if God is not building the house. This, this idea of vain, vanity has to do with emptiness and worthlessness. It comes to no result. I want you to feel that with me, that it doesn't matter how hard you work at things. If God is not, if you're the part of the people of God and you want to honor God, if God's not involved in what you're doing. It doesn't matter how hard you work at it. It isn't going to change the results. So how have you been doing with that? 2024 is here tomorrow, tonight. Many people will be making resolutions. So this next year I'm going to what? It's usually lose weight. I'm going to, you know, whatever it is I'm going to do. Do more of this, do less of that. How long do those things last? Usually, not very long. So what kind of resolution should you make this year? We once built a house many years ago, first church I pastored. And I, I met a guy who was not a member of my church, but I met a fellow that was a builder, and he said, I'll, we were talking one day, he said, I'll build you a house. I'll build you a house. I said, I've got this much money, and that's it. I said, I got no more than that, period. If you go over that, I got no more money. Oh, I think I can do it for that. Well, I was 25 years old, probably. I was young and stupid. I'm just old and stupid now. I hadn't learned a lot sometime. <laughs> but I took his word for it. We didn't have a contract, and we built that house, and we loved it. We were so excited about it. It wasn't a big house, but it was really nice. I mean, we're newly, pretty much newlyweds, not completely, but pretty much, and uh, we were excited. Comes to the end of this building time, this was in about 1980, maybe a little before that. It was probably, yeah, it was uh, about 79, 1980. 
I don't remember exactly what happened with the economy, but the points on a loan jumped out of sight just before we got ready to close the house. And it was going to create a great expense that was much more than what we expected. And I told the guy, I got no more money. I told you I got this much money. Well, you know what happened? We lost the house. We didn't get it. We never got to move in it. I was just crestfallen because I loved that house. And we'd poured a lot of time and, and energy and planning and picking out colors and all the stuff that we really wanted. I mean, this was going to be a nice little house. It wasn't very big, but it was really going to be nice. And we'd lost it. And there wasn't a thing I could do about it. Some years later, we built another house. My wife designed it. This time, things went unbelievably smooth, and we built a very nice house, and she got to live in her dream house. Now, don't think it was a mansion. It wasn't, but it was nice. And she, we loved it, and we were just saying, thank you, Lord. We got it for less money than we could imagine. I mean, it was great until we felt the Lord prompting us to move. And I had to watch my wife weep as she left her dream home. All the time knowing that it's just stuff. But do you, do you, do you feel that with me? Maybe some of you have been through that before. I mean, sometimes God interrupts and doesn't let you do what you want to. Sometimes he lets you do more than you want to or you thought you would. And sometimes he just changes things at any point in the, in the action there. Can you identify with that? Can you feel that unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it? He moves on unless the Lord keeps, guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. He doesn't say you shouldn't have watchmen. He doesn't say you shouldn't guard the city. He's just saying you're only limited in what you can do. You can stay up all night and watch and guard and yell and scream and do everything that you want to do, but unless God is in behind the scenes working and in control, there's always, there are always possibilities of things happening that you can't control. So the guards watching the city and a whole garrison of soldiers comes up and overtakes them. So what? Did it help? No. I mean, there are times in Scripture when God raised up armies and used armies and people to to sound alarms and that kind of thing. And there are other times when God absolutely intervened and did something without any help. Like slaying 186,000 Syrians, um, I think it was, in one night. Because there was a whole host of angels around that nobody could see. He took Jericho by telling the people just to march around the city. I mean, they had a part in that, but it wasn't to fight. God just caused the walls to fall flat. Who would have thought that? I mean, God has done some really strange things. Are you aware of that? And he often does it so that everybody goes, what, what's up? How come God doesn't seem to care about the way I would do it, and he does it in different ways? Well, so everybody would say, God did something. You remember with the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal where there had been no rain for three and a half years? Elijah declared that, a long story about all of that because of Ahab. And it comes to a point where there's going to be a contest between the prophets of Baal and Elijah, the prophet of God. And so they're going to have a contest. Elijah says, let's build fire, uh, an altar, put wood on it. And the God will call on our God, and the God who answers by fire, he'll be God. And so the prophets of Baal did all this, and they were screaming and yelling and dancing around and cutting themselves and crying out to their God, and Elijah was mocking them. And it becomes Elijah's turn, and he prays, and God sends fire. And, the pro and all the people said, the Lord, Yahweh, he is God. He's the God, not Baal. 
So God always wants to remind his people, whether he uses us in a significant way or he goes around us or he does what we expect or not what we expect, he is still God. Never forget it. Never miss it. Unless the watchman, unless the Lord keep the watch, the watchman, the guard, is wasting his time. Guard, yes. Do you have a security team here? I'm sure you do. But I want to tell you, unless God is in control, your security team will do absolutely no good. You can lock your doors at night, but that doesn't guarantee somebody won't be in, get in. You can amass weapons, do all that you want to do. And I'm not saying don't do it. I've been wrestling with that issue myself. But ultimately, ultimately, you can have an arsenal. And unless God is involved, it won't do you any good. I'm not saying, and I don't think God says, don't do those things. He just says, unless I'm involved, everything you do is going to be it's going to end differently than what I want and what you anticipated. Well, so we can only do so much. And so the next thing, let's hurry along. This is true. There's this tension between doing and resting and earning a living and doing your job. Verse 2, he says, it is vain. You see that twice. Um, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord keep the watch, the watchman wakes but in vain. Unless uh, it is vain for you to rise up early and to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, for he gives his loved, beloved sleep. You know, something that I've noticed, and I, I see that in myself too, there's something about us guys. When, ladies, I know you don't understand us. I'll just stop there, man. I won't say from our part. And they say there's no difference between men and women, and you can't tell. We're different, no doubt. There's something about men that when you ask a man, how, how you do it? Oh, I'm busy. Oh, I've been working hard. I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to work. And you think, wow. I used to know a preacher. I had him for a, rev- <laughs> for a revival one time. He was a good guy. But he was at some people's house, some leaders in the church, and he'd get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and pray real loud. The whole house could hear him. And they were going, do you know he gets up at 4 and prays every morning real loud? You know? Wow. And at that point, I was kind of impressed. I wasn't doing that. Solomon says, you know what, for you to get up early, to stay up late, work yourself to death, so what? God's not impressed. He gives you sleep so you don't have to do that all the time. Now, there may be seasons where you do it, and there may be times when God wants you to do that. There was a season in my life not too many years ago where God did some things in our life and put me in a a course of study that I really hadn't been pursuing and interested in. And I got into it and I found out quickly I was way over my head. And God did a work in my life that he's never done before and never done since. And I got up early and I stayed up late doing the work that was before me for a season. I had discipline that I've never had before nor sense. So he's not saying don't do those things ever. He's just saying don't don't be impressed with yourself. God doesn't need you to do that. He may call on you to do that, but he doesn't need you to do that. God is the one who is able to supply. He's the one who gives bread. He's the one who gives rest. We are responsible. Work, yes, work hard. The scriptures tell us to do those things. Just don't put all your hope in yourself because you can't pull it off unless God is energizing and unless God is directing and unless God is working and leading and prompting and all those things you're doing it in vain 
So don't get too impressed. The last thing he talks about in this tension between doing and resting is in having a family. Now let me say before I even get into this, this is not a blanket promise that God's going to get everybody a quiver full of children. And some of you say, thank you, Lord. And some of you, no doubt, maybe even in this room, would give anything if God would give you a child. So those things are in the provident hands of God. So these are not blanket promises, but they're principles that we can look at. Behold, children are a gift or an inheritance of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. This idea of inheritance uh, has to do with uh, God taking care of you and what's coming ahead, like in your latter days and so forth. I'm beginning to think more about that all the time. The reward idea has to do with payment. God is blessing you and rewarding you for faithfulness. And he does that, at least sometimes, through your children. Some of you think, well, you don't know my children. Well... Uh, nobody's children are perfect. But God, again, God is, is saying that the principle that he's saying is that children are a reward from God. In Leslie's my life, we've been married about a year, and I was the one that started saying, I, I really would like for us to have a child. God gave us a child. We named him Matthew, which means gift of Jehovah. Just the very thing, that, and I got that from this verse. The second child Leslie wanted, God gave us David, beloved of God. The third child, God wanted. <laughs> and we named her Stephanie, crowned one. We thought our life was falling apart at first. We were going, oh, Lord, what's happened? And it didn't take long till we found out what a great blessing we would have missed if God hadn't continued to give us another arrow for the quiver. And listen to what Solomon says about that. He says, they're like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are children of one's youth. In other words, he's talking about God gives them. But here's that's God's part. Our part is, is that you aim them and you launch them. But even that, it's up to God for them to hit the target. You can't make the arrow hit the target. You can do the best you can. You can aim well. You can be faithful as a parent. You can direct them and you can guide them and nurture them and do all that God has called you to be as a parent. But ultimately, God is sovereign over their lives just like he is over your life. Our children haven't done everything that we would like to have done, seen them do in every case, but neither have I. But we have seen him work in them and, and guide them and, and help them navigate through some difficulties in life and bring them to a point where he's working in all of their lives in significant ways. And we're just saying, Lord God, look what you're doing with the arrows that you put in our quiver. You've been faithful. They are an inheritance to us, and they are a reward for us. And some of the greatest disciples I have, and listen, I take my job seriously here at the Harmony Association. Some of my greatest disciples are my children. And I have some grandchildren, and we, I try to you know, spend some time with them, too. But I think my, one of my greatest jobs is to pour into my children and let them be the parents of their children. And we, we'll spoil the kids and then let them figure out what to do with them. Do you, do you see all this, how this is coming together? Paul is just saying the person who has them is, is going to be blessed, and they won't be ashamed when they come to the gate. The gate was a place of community activity and sometimes uh, leadership issues that would go on. And so God is saying your children can be that which will support you and help you and bless you and give honor to you as you pour into their lives. 
So the welfare that we enjoy the indiv individually and collectively, ultimately, all of that comes from God. So what's the takeaway? We plan. We prepare. We execute our plans the best we can. We build houses. We guard the home. We guard the city. We guard the church. We guard our loved ones and our community. We work hard. We launch and aim and launch the children God gives us like arrows. But all of that is in vain if the Lord is not conspicuously involved. He builds with us. He watches with us. He provides sustenance for us. He gives rest. He gives us an heritage with, for, as children and a reward of them being our children. All according to His prerogatives. All according to His providence. And all according to His pleasure. So I ask one more time as I close. What are going to be your resolutions for 2024? What's going to be your mindset? Does it need to change? Do you need to say, Lord God, either I haven't trusted you enough, I've tried to do too much, or either none of the above, I need to do more, and I need to trust you more. I don't know what, what you need to do. I can't tell you. But let your mindset, let this ring in your ears, unless the Lord is conspicuously involved. You labor in vain in everything you do. Whew. I wish I could just preach to you sinners. I, I need to wrestle with this, and I am wrestling with this myself. Let's pray. Lord God, we are thankful for your word. Oh God, I... I know how to talk about this a lot better than I know how to do it. You've taught me a lot over the years, and yet I have so much more to learn. I have so much more to yield. I have so much more to do. So God, I pray that you would give us all perspective on our own lives, individually and collectively. May we be diligent. May we work hard. But may we never be impressed with our work. May we always be humble in our accomplishments. May we be content in you doing what you want in spite of what we want. And Lord, above all, may you be glorified in all things. And so we commit our 2024 future to you as we enter in. Lord God, work in us and with us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need to respond to the Lord in some way this morning, I invite you to do that. Jim will be here in front to greet you, and I pray God will bless you and keep all these things in perspective as we enter into 2020. Would you stand?
all the church said. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, thank you so much for being here today for worship. Uh, we're happy you were uh, able to join us. Uh, Brother Mike, thank you for being here today and sharing God's Word. We always appreciate you coming. And uh, you're dismissed. Happy New Year, everybody. God bless. Two.